right. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gents. Um, great to be following a real passionate um, dairy man in David um, and seeing some really good cows. Yeah, that was my former life. Um, things have moved on. Have I moved to the dark side? I'm not sure, but um, we're here and still smiling. Right, let's get the right one here. Okay, so Keythorpe Farms. I actually moved to Keythorpe Farms in 1990 um, with the remit to have the highest yielding herd of cows in the country and win the Gold Cup. And fortunately, Peter Dixon Smith had, this, well, he, it was his, his vision, um, and we managed to achieve that in the, in the mid 90s. And yeah, up there, you may remember her, the chief, High Point Chief Mary, um, pictured there at 164 tonnes of milk, and she finished up doing 176 tonnes of milk, classified excellent 96 5E, um, 17 first prizes at the Royal Show. Um, so I love Holsteins, and I still love Holsteins. Um, can never get away from that. But in 2003, Peter Dixon Smith was 70. Um, and what we were finding at the end of the, end of the 90s, early 2000s, we were a very high input, high output herd. So in 2000, we actually did 12,000 litres with a cell count of 93. Um, so back then, it was a fair bit of milk. But what we were finding was, you know, there was an awful lot of margin going out of the door, and we were um, feeding for marginal litres, and that was putting pressure on the, the overall profitability of the farm. So we sold the lion's herd in 2003. Peter offered me the farm on an FBT. I would have needed about £450,000 worth of ingoings to, to take it on. I didn't have that sort of money. I didn't even have the confidence in the dairy industry at that time to do that. Um, so Peter said, would you be prepared to go into a partnership? And I said, yeah, definitely. So we both put money in at the start. And now we've built our shares up to a 50-50 share within the business. Um, Peter still owns all the land at Keythorpe. But that's what we did. We restocked with commercial cows. So I was looking for a, a wider cow, a shorter cow, um, but still a Holstein, Holstein Friesian cow, black and white cow, because having worked with a cow like this, you could just see how, how hard a Holstein could work for you and how efficient they could be. Very quickly realized that in 2004, you know, we were gonna make a living, but we weren't gonna grow a business. Um, and I, I question this square to a circle. I actually prefer a circle because you can roll it on and make it a bit bigger. And you know, you have circles on rally cars and I like that as well. So I, I do like circles. Um, so we looked at adding value and we, either, we, we were either going to add value or to get bigger. And there was no point getting bigger because the margin wasn't there to get bigger. We would have had to invest in a lot of capital. And so we went to organic at that point. Um, it was a real shock to the system. Peter Dixon Smith said, on your head be it. I don't agree with it, on your head be it. Um, but it was, a real, it was a real turning point in terms of the, the business for us. 2006, when you don't put nitrogen on a farm that has become addicted to nitrogen and chemicals, it doesn't grow anything. You know, our, our forage production went down to about 60%, and you get a conversion grant, um, and you think, oh, well, I'll save some of that, but in reality, you just have to buy feed and feed it, because, you know, when you've got no biology in your soil, you don't grow, you don't grow a lot. Okay. We started uh, 2007 selling organic milk. Um, I actually converted quicker than any other one, anyone else had converted in the past because I, I just played the system a little bit and bought in a lot of forage, which was great. So I actually hit a, hit a really good milk price in the autumn of 2007. And then 2008, we had the most profitable year we'd ever had on the farm. And suddenly Peter Dixon Smith started to take notice um, and he was, he perhaps came on back on board at that point, um, which was great. So we were really starting to get going. 2008, I actually, um, I needed some more staff on farm, but I couldn't, I couldn't really justify another man. So what I did, I actually took on a contract farming agreement on another conventional unit. 
So 300 spring and autumn carbon cows on a low cost system. So I took that on, on a, in a contract farming agreement and that actually paid for another man to come on farm. So that's, that's how I achieved another man, another, another labor unit on farm. And that's, that's still running. Um, I've got a partner there and they actually make yogurt. It's an award-winning yogurt, Manor Farm Yogurts. And I think that business could become available in the future as, as, the, as the owners get a little a bit older. But we had a massive hit in 2009 and we, had, we got TB. Uh, and over 2009, 2010, that actually took out 140 head. So it was absolutely massive in terms of the momentum within the business. Um, but on the profitability of 2008, I still had confidence in, in expanding. So 2010, we changed the parlour, put in a 2448 parlour, herringbone, one man. In the summer, we can get up to 170 cows an hour through it. So it's pretty lean and mean. Um, and then in 2011, I've always had a passion to actually own some of my own land. Um, it's probably not the right thing to do in terms of business, well, it might be, in terms of business sense, but that's just me. I'm a farmer, I want some of my own land. So in 2011, we actually bought 2,274 acres. Um, and it was great because Peter had the collateral in Keythorpe Farms to actually back it. Um, the business is paying for it. We own that on a 50-50 basis. Hopefully I'll buy him out in a, in a couple of years' time. 2011-12, the organic milk price took a bit of a tumble and there was only about two and a half, two and a half to three pence a litre margin on the organic. And so that really made me start to question whether our future was organic. And there were a lot of good guys jumped out at that time. Um, Tom Rawson, the Norman brothers, and you know a lot of real good guys got out. So I actually applied for a Nuffield scholarship to see if I could find some answers and see if I could actually drive up dry matter production. And fortunately enough, I, I actually got a Nuffield scholarship in 2013. And any of you guys out there, there is a, there's a massive void in the Nuffield um, group of high yielding Holstein guys. And I think it's, it tends to be very low cost system based, but don't be put off by it because it's an opportunity to go and learn and gather knowledge from around the world, which is, you know, which can transform your business and your outlook to, you know, where you're taking things. So I would really implore, and Nuffield is a great, is a great um, group of people. So 2013, went off and did the Nuffield. Um, 2014, I was writing my Nuffield report and a farmer came to me and said, I've got 145 acres um, here that I'm growing black grass on. Um, would you like to take it on for two years, sort it out, and then I have it back for arable production? And I said, well, unfortunately, it doesn't quite work like that organically. We've got to have it for at least seven years. So I took it on, got an FBT on it for seven years, um, did a business plan, and now we've put a, put a dairy unit on it. So the land was offered in, to me in June of 2014, and then we started milking um, in April 2015 on the dairy unit. So that's, that's pretty much the last 25 years. Right, so the Keythorpe herd today, um, 350 autumn calving Holsteins, um, looking to do 7,500 to 8,000 litres, not interested in marginal litres, feeding them well through the winter months, Fairly tight block, calving from September through until first week of December. Ideally, if I could pull that back to mid-November, that would be ideal, but I'm not so, I'm not so precious about that, that block. And then we've got 160 spring calving cows, and we're moving up to 250. We won't get there this year. We'll get up to, yeah, we'll get up to just under 200, 200 cows this time. Um, I have been breeding the spring herd to New Zealand genetics, but when you look at a lot of New Zealand genetics, they're, they're Holstein based, and um, so it's just a different line of Holstein and um, higher fat and protein and um, a bit better fertility on some. There is a crossbred cow there. Um, when we were clear, when we got hit by TB, we actually brought in a lot of cows. So there were Fleck V crosses, Monty crosses, um, Scandinavian reds. 
that was most of them. We actually used Jersey crosses on the conventional farm as well. And I think there are merits in the hybrid vigor, um, but I do still like the Holstein K. Um, if I can't find, going forward, if I can't find the right Holstein bull to breed to the, to, to the Holsteins on the autumn calving herd, I will actually go to Scandinavian Red K um, as a crossbred K, one cross in and then go back to the Holstein after that. Um, so this is Glebe Farm, yeah, just set up. Uh, this is Rutland Water, so it's actually in Rutland, so with the, uh, with the only the secondary herd in Rutland, and I think there's a massive opportunity to be looking at vending machines in Oakham and Uppingham. Um, they're a fairly, it's a fairly wealthy county, and um, if I can get pasteurised whole milk into in there, that'll be great going forward. So infrastructure. We actually aim to feed the cows well through the winter and get them turned out onto grass as soon as we can um, and drive cost out of the system. But infill structure is key. Um, so we've got sleeper tracks. And then this, this track is, is, this is actually at Glebe. This is at Keythorpe. But you can see here, um, this was a stone road. But we've actually got the AstroTurf. And that came, came from here, um, from the Commonwealth Games. So it's real good quality stuff. And they trot up there really well. Um, but it, you know, if you're going to graze, and these cows actually go right down to the bottom here, so they'll, they'll be walking a mile um, down to the far end of the, the farm to graze. But the whole scenes, they can do it. You know, do not underestimate it. Um, paddock grazing, so we are we're all on paddocks. Uh, last year we turned out the 18th of the 2nd. This year, if weather conditions improve, historically February's been one of our driest months in the year. Um, August is the wettest month and February is the driest month. So if you've got the infrastructure, we can actually get out there. And, you know, you shouldn't underestimate the quality of the grass that's out there. You know, there is quality protein there. You have to balance up the energy a bit, but there is quality protein there. We're looking to go in at about 2,800 kilos of dry matter. Um, this is, I think this is the area that I've got to challenge going forward because at this level, we're taking off very young grass every time. And at that level, we don't give the plant any time to exude any energy back into the soil and feed the biology. And in, in an organic system, you know, it's absolutely critical that we do that. So I will be adopting a fertilizer policy this coming year, and that will be with uh, sulfur boron, um, molasses, and fish to actually feed that biology. Um, and that'll help with growing some topsoil as well, but we'll go into that in a bit. Coming out at uh, 1,500, yeah. And then on the, on the fourth round and the sixth round, we always go in and cut and graze. Um, it's a really good way of tidying up the paddocks, taking out any, any tufts that haven't been grazed. Um, and we do, we go around the whole block. So we'll mow every afternoon, we'll mow enough for two feeds, and then the cows will just go in and clear up. And what you actually find is you get a higher, a higher dry matter intake on the cut and graze system while you're going round. But there's obviously a cost to that, so it's about balancing that cost with the, with the increasing um, intakes. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that's, that's a system that works really well for us. Grass silage. Um, Late heading perennial rye grasses, which would be this. Um, we have got um, some Italian, so that was that was our first cut grass silage this year. So in terms of the the conservation land, growing silage, we can keep up with the conventional guys, not a problem. You know, with the lucerne, the red clover, we can be doing 14 tons dry matter um, per hectare without any trouble at all. It's the grazing platform where we would struggle. Um, so we're doing about eight and a half tons of dry matter, but hopefully with the fertilizer policy that we're adopting, we can push that up to about 10. On the conventional unit, we're doing, we're doing around 11, 11 and a half tons of dry matter per hectare. So we are a little bit behind in terms of production, but I hope that we can, we can actually push that forward. Lucerne, this is, you know, it's a crop that's fed around the world. It is the best forage that you can feed to a dairy cow. It does take a little bit of growing. Um, it is a legume, so it loves calcium. Regardless of pH, you need to be getting calcium onto it. Well, any legume, basically, else you won't, you won't get a good stand. The establishment, we establish it in the spring under a spring barley or a spring triticale or something like that. Um, 
you don't get a lot out of it the first year, but then it can, then it can last sort of four or five years after that. But it, this, is, this is quality protein, true protein. So it's not like high fertilized grass. Um, you know, your true protein in here, you're looking between 18 and we've had it up to 24, and 24 now. So it's excellent in terms of quality protein, but also for the digestible fiber in there. And, and when we fed it in the past, I started feeding it when we were on the high yielding cows. And what you saw, as soon as you put that loose and into the, into the cow and into the room, and you'd see about four inches, four, five, maybe six inches on the rumen girth, because suddenly you, you increase that efficiency in the rumen and the rumen capacity. Um, so a superb feed. I've, I've put no fertilizer requirement there. Because we're on heavy clay, we've actually got a well, fairly heavy clay, and some people would say, well, you shouldn't be growing lucerne on fairly heavy clay, but it depends on your, on your drainage. But you've got a massive bank of P and K in that soil, and with lucerne, you've got a rooting system that'll go down metre, metre and a half, and it can actually mobilise a lot of the P and K. So a lot of guys would say, oh, you need to be sticking on slurry on your lucerne. Well, if you are on sand, yeah, you do need to be slick, sticking slurry on, but if you're on clay, you can mobilise an awful lot of that P and K from your soils with it. Uh, red clover, we actually plant red clover around the outside of the lucerne because the red clover will suppress weeds better than the, red, uh, than the lucerne. Um, doesn't last as long, we establish it in the spring fairly similarly. We, we will do it as a straight stand, um, the red clover. And it'll build, it, won't build, it won't build as much nitrogen in the soil as your lucerne, but um, it, it does do a good job. Fodder beet, uh, that was the smallest one in the field. Um, you should have seen some of the big ones, that one. It's quite a good one. Um, but no, we, we've been growing fodder beet now for six, six years. Um, we've been up to 28 uh, tonnes fresh weight um, per acre. This year, well, we took some early. It was doing about 24, and then we had to go back in at Christmas, and you can imagine what that's like. So we've got quite a lot of mud coming through at the moment, but... It's our own mud, it's our own soils out of our own field, so I'm happy, you know, it's not affecting the cow's intakes. Um, and then what we do is uh, the, grass, the grass silage comes out, sorry, the grass comes out, um, and then three weeks before the breeding season, the fodder beet goes in, so we're seeing an uplift in dry matter intake because they'll always eat the fodder beet over the top, so we can look on about a kilo and a half dry matter intake increase. Um, and obviously it's an excellent uh, sugar source. And then through the winter, we'll get up to about a kilo and a half, two kilos, two kilos of fodder beet through the service period, through the winter, and then as the fodder beet comes out, the grass starts coming back in in the spring. So we've always got a succulent feed in there, you know, driving dry matter intakes. Uh, triticale, triticale's been an excellent crop for us in the past, um, but unfortunately now, now we've come into yellow rust, so it's just killed itself out. 16 years we've been growing triticale very successfully, but the last two years we've been hit with yellow rust, and it's just the strains of rust that are now about. And, you know, this was a new variety that was meant to be good this year, but it's, it's just failed for us, so we'll go to the oats. This is, this is quite an interesting picture. So this is lucerne underneath. Um, so we went in and we combined the triticale, got just under two tonnes of triticale grain off the field. We then went back in, uh, bailed up the straw, so, and we left a stubble um, about 18 inches tall, then allowed the lucerne to grow up through and flower. We then went back in with a forager um, and chopped all that, and that was dry cow feed, so it was a mix of straw and lucerne, which was really good, and then we went back in and got bales afterwards. So. In terms of yield of lucerne in the first year, if we do it smart, we can you know, get reasonable yields out of it. And then we were using it as a big old whole crop. Um, so that would be, well, that, that did 15 tonnes um, fresh weight at 30% dry matter, and that grew in 100 days. So with the synergies there of the cereal and the legume, we can actually um, get some really good yields out of it. Oats, oats uh, have been a crop that's been seriously underestimated in dairy diets and, well, the athletes eat them. We used to feed horses on them. You know, they are a quality feed. They have anti-nutritive factors, um, you know, for cows. And, you know, they're a far better feed than, than wheat to a dairy cow. 
The problem was, you know, the breeding programs, they could actually get a lot more yield out of wheat than they could do with oats, but I think oats are seeing a resurgence now. These were used as a cover crop prior to the, the fodder beet going in last year. Um, that, was, that was the crop of oats, not this last year, year before. Um, that had been a field that had been in grass. We went in, we ploughed it, didn't have any, didn't have, didn't have any muck on it. Um, drilled the oats and then went back in, combined it. So the last thing in the field was the drill because it rained, so we couldn't get in there with a the roller. Next thing was the combine, and that did three ton. Yeah, and the, con the contractor couldn't believe that it had done three ton an acre. So it is possible. The reason why oats are so undervalued is because they've got a, such a large root mass and they can mobilise the P and K within the soils and actually start to, start to get your soils working. So oats, yeah, great product. I love oats. Righto, so that's sort of key thought and glee. Um, I had some questions to ask, and you know, I I chose a topic from enough field of sustainable milk production because I didn't know which way it was going to go. I didn't know whether I was going to go back conventional at that time or whether I was going to stay organic. So that was that was the topic I chose, um, and then it ended up my final title ended up with a vital role of soil for feed integrity. So I went off to Denmark and Sweden um, looking at the red cow because I'd had some experience of her and they've got some good red cows out there um, in Denmark and Sweden. And as I say, I would use her as a crossbreeding cow um, if I need to crossbreed, if I can't find the right Holstein at the time. And then Australia and New Zealand. Um, this, this was Vasbo Farms up in Sweden. So they were, they'd got a red herd and a black herd, and they got 1,400 cows um, on an organic system. Uh, really good. This is Tom Phillips's one herd down in New Zealand. Um, and if you want to look at true sustainability of the, the whole concept, I think Tom Phillips had it, had it just about bang on down at, down at um, the university there. This was, this was a crossbred herd um, in Denmark. And it was very noticeable as I went around. They'd just taken a real hit on their, on their milk price. Um, but this was the guy who had the new kit on farm and was, you know, was making a lot of money. So I think crossbreeding, there is a place for it. But you know, it's not that I'm to totally going that way. So what these guys were doing, they were all looking at the soils, the best guys. And they were adopting um, the Albrecht system. So the the critical ratios here is the cal-mag ratio. Okay, so the amount of calcium and the amount of magnesium in your soil. If you see here, so these are just two samples from, from our discussion group, actually. Um, so these are two samples. So here, we're very low in mag. Now, if your soil is very low in mag, you cannot get production out of that soil because your plants will not photosynthesize to their optimum level. Okay, so what you need to do, you can't influence that soil that much in terms of putting large amounts of product on to change this, but what you do need to do is to be looking at a fertilizer policy that will address this lack of magnesium. So on a, you know, on a, a yearly basis or even monthly basis, you'll need to be looking for some sort of magnesium to be sure that um, you're getting, getting crop production. Likewise on this one, and if I was to choose the soil between the two, I would choose this one because this one is, is high mag. So if it's high mag, you'll have a very tight soil. But a lot of people um, will look at their soil and they'll, they'll have a tight soil and it'll be poaching. And everyone will say, well, you need to go through with a, slord, a sward slitter or a flat lift or something to actually lift this soil up and aerate it without looking at the, the um, cow mag ratio. And it's, it's pointless putting iron in your soil until you've actually addressed this CalMag ratio. So this one's pretty easy to fix. You can go on there with two tons of gypsum. Um, so high calcium, regardless of pH. Um, if, if you've got a low pH, well, you'd go straight on with lime to lift that pH. Um, but if your pH was good, you'd go on with gypsum. And your gypsum is calcium and sulfur, dead cheap. You know, recycled gypsum, eight, eight pound a ton, nine pound a ton. So, you know, we've... There are things here, and a lot of, a lot of guys don't, don't know their base saturation levels in their soil. And at the end of the day, our soil is one of our biggest assets on farm. And we can actually, um, 
build resilience and you know, hopefully get more profit out if we look after our soils properly. This was, this was an interesting one. I went on a Regen Ag course. So yeah, there, was, there were professors on it and gardeners and you know, a few hippies and all the rest of it. Um, but the good thing was, was this, this chromo was about the best at the course. My chromo was the best, best chromo there. So it showed how our soils were actually functioning. And it was great to think that I was up against all these gardeners. And it really highlighted to me, as us as dairy farmers, has a ma have a massive opportunity to enhance our soils and to be looking at collaboration with arable farmers going forward because we have, we have a massive asset in terms of the, um, the muck that we've got on farm and the biological systems that we can create. So, Going to the chromo, this is the internal zone, so this is the mineral zone, this centre zone here, that's showing the amount of organic matter, so there's lots of organic matter there. You've then got the peripheral, peripheral zone, and that's showing the amount of biology that's in the soil. And then you've got the rays that interlink the mineral and the organic matter and showing how much biology. So, so it's, a, it's a real good look-see to see how your soil is actually working and functioning. Not very many people use it, um, but I liked it because I could look at it and, well, I suppose, I suppose it was, mine was the best there, so I guess I'd like it anyway. But, um, so looking at more chromos, this was, this was one out of the same hole at 50 centimetres. So at 50 centimetres depth, you can see a larger mineral zone, less organic matter, um, but still biological activity working between the 50 centimetres and, and the top layer, which was really good. This, this, other, this other chromo, this, was, this is just highlighting, they, this is a mango, mango orchard, and they'd been spraying, to keep, spraying this orchard to keep weeds down for years and years and years, and basically they'd mummified the soil bi biology with glyphosate, um, and so what you've got here, high mineral zone, no organic matter in the soil because it's all left on top because there's no biology to actually pull it down into the soil. The critical thing about, well, we'll go on to the next slide. Where are we going now? Right, this is, this is a good one. Um, there are 74,000 tonnes of N above every hectare in the atmosphere. Okay, absolutely massive, and yet we're buying it in, in, in bags all the time. Okay, so what we've got to do, I, uh, well, N's cheap at the moment, but we have the potential to actually pull a lot of that N out of the sky and get it into our soil. And obviously the legumes do that, but if we look after our soils better, we can actually get grass plants to do this as well. So the only way we're going to get that to, to occur is for our soils to be breathing and to be actually getting air into our soils. Um, this is a penetrometer, and you can see here, um, thread roots on plants will grow until they hit 300 PSI. So this is a real good indicator of where your aerobic or anaerobic zone will start. Oh, crumbs, I'm running out of time. Okay. So what we want to do is actually increase your, the, the aerobic zone and you can grow your topsoil um, by doing that. Go a bit faster. Um, the soil food web, we only know about 2% of the soil food web and the synergies and what this can actually do for us. Um, earthworms, if you've got 24 earthworms per square foot per acre, um, you've got about a million earthworms. Earthworms have a four year life cycle quarter die off every year, they're releasing 60 kilos of N into, into that soil um, on a yearly basis. And everybody talks about renewables. These are our renewables, these are our efficiencies, and this is where we've lost some of our efficiencies um, in the past. CO2, um, CO2 is absolutely massive. Uh, plants have the stomata on the underside of their leaf and that is to catch the CO2 that is meant to be coming out of the ground. Okay, so the air goes in, the, uh, feeds the microbes, the microbes are breaking down the organic matter, they're releasing CO2, and then you get your plant growth. So we all, we all, historically we've all thought about NPK, but actually CO2 is a limiting factor to plant growth, 
and these, these other minerals. Um, this is Gary Zimmer, um, and he's, he's a biological dairy farmer, and he's an author, great bloke. He's, he's, actually, he's actually advising on about 80,000 acres, not just organic, but biological farming and how to reduce inputs. Mob grazing, I think the conventional guys ought to be looking at this because there's a Sorry, the arable guys ought to be looking at this because this is one way of actually building your organic matter very, very quickly. And this was 500 head of dairy steers ranging from four months to 22 months. They don't look very pretty, um, but actually they were building organic matter and they were making a profit out of these, out of these dairy steers. Uh, went down to Australia, Camperdown Compost, we have a massive opportunity as dairy farmers to, to be making compost, a live organic fertilizer. You need a carbon source. You can actually put mineral into your compost so you're chelating the mineral so it's a more bioavailable form. Um, and a compost, true compost, is time, 10 times more efficient than FYM. And I think, you know, it's a bit of a brainstorm. Or it's, it's a you know, something that we just need to adopt. You can actually put soil from your best paddock in there and multiply up your soil biology as well once you get it to the right temperature. Foliar feeds, this is where I'm going this year, but this was a guy um, down in Palmerston North, New Zealand. So he's putting a carbon source and he, was, he wasn't organic, but he dropped his nitrogen use from 240 kilos of N down to 40 and he was doing 16 kilos, 16 sorry, 16 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. Um, so he'd maintained his production, he dropped his end use by just looking at the base saturation levels and actually feeding his soil and feeding his bi soil biology. Uh, plant diversity, absolutely massive. You know, we've, we've adopted monocultures and speaking to a botanist in Sweden, Olaf Larsson, you know, we are not realizing the synergies that should be occurring between plants. And he, he is absolutely adamant that that will take us to the next level in terms, of, in terms of production, working with the synergies of plants and how they should function together. This was an interesting one. This was an organic guy um, in Denmark. So this was spring wheat, uh, spring peas and spring lupins. And that was basically his concentrate. That's all he had on farm. So he was combining those. He was then heat treating them on farm through a, a big auger with a big fire underneath it. And he was doing nine and a half thousand litres, all homegrown. You know, so it was, it was just, a, just a bit of an eye opener. Um, what else we got there? Chicory and plantain. You know, some of these herbal mixes, they will mobilise um, a lot more mineral. And there are definitely health benefits in terms of the tannins and the turpins in the in, you know, that, that they bring to, the, bring to the animals. Yeah. Right, just about there. The quality and the integrity of the feed that we produce to, on our farm is a result of the way we manage our soils. The first thing I saw on farm at Keythorpe that changed when I turned organic was, all, was the soil. And then later on, we've seen health benefits coming through in the cows. So right now, at this moment in time, we're running at nine cases per 100 for mastitis. Um, last year we had a culling rate of 13.6 on the 468 head. Um, we have dropped production, but I think there are, we're now seeing some of the, the true mineral um, movement from the soil to the plant, and we're growing higher integrity feed. So conclusions, um, yeah, manage, the way we manage our soils has a direct impact in the integrity of our feed. Soil biology and plant diversity and will build resilience and efficiencies in our farming systems, nutrient density. Um, we have a massive opportunity as dairy farmers to multiply soil biology and get our soils in better heart. Plants grown in high biological soils are less prone to disease and pests um, because they have a higher sugar content and aphids cannot digest complex sugars and that's what you get in a biological soil is higher, more complex sugars. The excessive use of fertilizers and chemicals will shut down um, biological function. And I'm, I'm not professing that organic is the way forward, but 
biological farming is certainly um, a way that we can bring some efficiencies back on farm. I looked at um, some of the first generation GM technology when I was, when I was out there as well. And certainly first year generation GM technology is, is questionable. And in America, well, we're now selling 65% of our milk to America because there's a massive backlash against GM technology over there. There we go. Sorry, I ran over a little bit. All right.